Welcome uh, to this, uh, the second talk in the series, uh, Digital Debates, which is organized by Debates on Europe. Debates on Europe is a series of events organized by the S. Fischer Foundation in Berlin and the German Academy for Language and Literature based in Darmstadt. Uh, since its inception in uh, 2012, in cooperation with local partners across the continent and beyond, Debates on Europe has been hosted in places where the idea of Europe is at stake, and these events have addressed the most pressing issues uh, on the European agenda. In this uh, Corona spring or summer of 2020, uh, this endeavor has moved online uh, into the digital sphere, sphere under the title Debates digital. Uh, here in this space, some of the writers, scholars and public intellectuals in the Debates on Europe network give insight into parts of Europe otherwise underexposed in most international media from Minsk and Moscow in the east to Belfast in the west. Um, texts and talks, uh, we get in text and talks, we get reports on social and cultural and political developments, but also analysis of the immediate and long-term consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Last time uh, we talked about, uh, or we talked to Belfast-based writer Jan Carson and to Belarusian journalist and dissident Irina Vidanova. Uh, and then we discussed how the failures of politicians and governments in response to the COVID-19 crisis have caused allegiances to shift and pave the way, uh, pave, uh, the way for uh, a profound political change, also in the positive sense, both in Northern Ireland and in Belarus. Today, we're going to focus on how authoritarian politicians are using this health crisis to limit the political freedom and to further their version of a liberal democracy. We have uh, two protagonists uh, uh, in this talk, and this is Anna Lengiel, who is a Hungarian dramaturg, translator, and director. And she's the founder of Panodrama, which is an independent, uh, independent creative production company and the only documentary theater in Hungary. Uh, her own work deals with uh, pressing issues in Hungary, such as nationalism, anti-Roma sen sentiments, uh, homophobia, pedophilia. Uh, Dubravka Stojanovic is a Serbian historian and professor at the Belgrade University. Her work focuses on democracy in Serbia and in the Balkans, uh, about interpretation of history in textbooks and in teaching and uh, also the history of women in Serbia. She's also a consultant to the United Nations and she's working on issues concerning history, memory and the misuse of history in education. And she talked uh, eloquently about this um, uh, in Belfast at the last real uh, debate on Europe uh, that was held there uh, in autumn last year. So, uh, I would now like to start the discussion, but before I do that, I will uh, encourage everyone who's looking at this now, whether uh, in the Zoom room uh, where we are now or uh, via YouTube to ask questions. You can ask questions throughout this, um, this session. Uh, I want to start to ask, uh, you both actually, uh, but I start with Dubravka. What is the situation in Belgrade right now? Do I need a face mask to go and shop? Do I have to stay uh, at home? Good evening. Thank you, everybody who is with us today. Well, I must say, unfortunately, no. We are totally free, and we are free because we have elections on June 21st. And this is what our president, Alexander Vucic, had decided because this is the last moment that he can get <clears throat> some 80% at elections because obviously the economic crisis will come later. So that's why he decided to take <clears throat> off all the measures. We are totally free. We had uh, 
city derby in Belgrade, uh, Red Star Partisan with 30,000 people at the, at the stadium. We had Novak Djokovic with tennis uh, tournament with 15,000 people. We have parties, we have uh, uh, every kind of gatherings. And uh, <clears throat> this is really uh, one of the extreme cases that I know because uh, we are already in the second wave or or I don't know, maybe it's still the first wave, but every day we have some about 60 new cases and uh, now nobody believes that it's only 60 per day because <clears throat> it's obviously that the curve is going up again and we all think that they are, they're, they're, they're misusing and they're giving us some false, uh, false data about the cases because it's clear that because of elections they just let the country free and then the citizens were not responsible enough so they took their liberty and freedom totally and they're just acting as if there is nothing around us so i think that situation is rather dangerous and uh, which we can see now almost all the neighboring countries montenegro and croatia and greece uh, close their frontiers for, for citizens of Serbia because it's obvious that, that there is a, a new wave of corona here. Uh, I know something as a Swede about uh, having the borders closed in the front of, of your nose. Uh, Anna, how is the situation in, um, in Budapest? Hello and uh, welcome to all. Um, I'm very surprised what, uh, by this um, because we, in our case it's the opposite. I'm actually now uh, broadcasting from a hospital which has nothing to do with the, um, with the coronavirus. I had minor surgery today which was uh, scheduled very late so that's why I couldn't put it on another date but I think it's, uh, I, make, I can make it clearest by describing the protocol that I had to go through. So um, you enter the building and even if you just go uh, for ambula ambulatory, um, 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 just to meet your doctor uh, or whatever, even then you have to fill out a form, your, um, uh, you will, uh, your temperature will be taken and, and you have to absolutely wear a mask in the hospital. But since I, had, I came uh, for surgery, it was much more complicated. So I had to First, um, there was a group of five women who were taken um, uh, that day, admitted that day. And first they took our blood uh, for the, to check for the antibodies. So that's when obviously everyone knows, I guess, uh, when you already had the disease and um, you conquered it. And uh, then you get the other test uh, where they stick a thing up your nose and into your mouth. And that's the that's to check whether you actually have the virus now. And then uh, once the um, antibody test comes back negative, you are all taken into a, actually to a quarantine, to a, a, a room which is quarantined. And then the, all the nurses, I know this hospital very well because I, I have cancer and I have had many surgeries in the past three years. So I know the regular protocol, but this is now completely different. They are not only wearing masks, but pretty much the whole outfit. Um, and that's how they take your blood pressure and all that. And on, only until, only after the uh, second text uh, comes back, which tells you whether or you, uh, not you have the virus, this is around the evening, so it was yesterday evening. Then you are told, okay, you are all good. And then uh, things go back to normal. And then you either get put into different uh, rooms or you stay together. But if, uh, and this is very telling, if they find someone with the virus, then the whole room goes home and no surgery will happen the next day. I'm told in the past uh, three and a half months, this only happened twice. Uh, all together in the, you know, during the peak of the uh, virus. But this has a lot to do with this amazing protocol that this um, um, uh, clinic, which is the, um, belongs to the Semmelweis University, it's the transplantation and surgery clinic. Other than that, people are wearing masks uh, on public transportation. It is required. Not everyone keeps it, but most people do. You're not uh, required to wear a mask on the street. And if you go into a shop, you, have, you are required to uh, wear a mask. 
most people keep that as well. But actually, at this point, um, there is no real, um, you know, there is no virus situation. There is no outbreak at this moment. Obviously, it may come back. But, uh, but for now, we're pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, let me stay with you, Anna. Uh, when this whole thing started uh, in Hungary, uh, you got a kind of uh, indicate, or in Europe, and then in Hungary, where the first cases were, you got a kind of indication of what uh, the uh, perception and interpretation uh, of this uh, uh, disease and this threat uh, would be. Could you tell us about some of the first cases? There were, for example, a group of uh, Iranians uh, that were diagnosed with COVID-19 and the response to that. Um, I am not entirely sure if all the viewers are aware of the fact that uh, Viktor Orban, um, uh, who is the prime minister in Hungary and who has been that for 10 years now, and who is very proud of running what he calls an illiberal democracy, and who is uh, in, um, in fact an um, autocrat at the least. Um, um, so he, had, he has an extremely strong anti-immigration campaign. Uh, since uh, 2015, since the crisis, or slightly before that. And that's what gets him elected. At least it, it's a very big part. It plays a very big part in getting him elected. So there is a lot of anti-immigration hatred uh, um, um, ca campaign going on the whole time with you know, huge posters and, and uh, on TV. And they are spending immense amounts of money on this. And uh, as... It always, as it's always the case, uh, usually it's those who never, who have never seen a foreigner in their lives, uh, let alone a migrant or a refugee, who are most terrified of this and who are most gullible and can be told that the only way to save this country from um, immigrants raping our daughters and robbing our houses is to vote for Viktor Orban. So this is a start. And then when the first cases, it was indeed... Um, a group of uh, Iranian uh, students studying to be dentists at this very university where I am now, not at this building because this is a huge university and, and a very, very good one also on the world uh, market. So many, we have many, I mean, they have many international students. And there was a group of uh, Iranian students who first uh, got, or, or more exactly two Iranian students who first got, uh, were diagnosed uh, with the virus. So Orban tried to um, uh, uh, start and keep a rhetoric for as long as he could, uh, where, where he said that, uh, uh, that it's the foreigners who b bring in the virus into the country. I'm sorry for some of the background noise, but like I said, I'm in a hospital, so I can't really tell them to shut up. So sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so this went on for a little while, uh, but uh, uh, not very long, I must say. Although they, um, they, uh, they, uh, all of these Iranian students, a large group, not just the two, were actually, um, I can't think of the right word now, expelled from Hungary. But what's the word? Yeah, anyway, it's the wrong word, but uh, all, we all know, deported from Hungary. So first, but, but in a way where they are forbidden to enter the EU again for three years, and that means that, uh, that their whole future is, they, these students are private students, so they have paid a lot of money for this education. Some of them were in their ninth year, so their very final, final last moment of studies as in residences and all that. And all of that is, you know, it just goes to um, ba waste um, mostly. Um, and there was a, uh, first they didn't even want to have any kind of legal uh, process. Uh, which is when the Helsinki committee stepped in and they said, no, that's, that's not possible. You can't uh, simply deport them uh, without any, any uh, due process. So then uh, there was a sort of a mock due process and they were just deported anyway. So mm -hmm. this is how it started. Yeah, it started like that uh, and it continued like that, at least if one should uh, believe uh, the text that you have contributed to this uh, series, where you uh, diagnose uh, the health crisis as just a continuation of the crisis of human dignity in Hungary. And the conclusion would then be that even when the virus uh, will be gone, this crisis of human dignity, as 
the treatment of these Iranians uh, would be an example of, would still be there. So what followed was that Orban uh, got the parliament to uh, take a so-called, in English it's called an emergency law, which gives him the right to rule by the by decree. And the big thing about that law uh, was that it was not limited in time, as several other laws were uh, in, in um, around Europe. Now, I think there is a, a, a time set for when this law will be uh, taken back. But uh, could you tell us a little bit about not what this law has done in order to uh, intervene and try to cope with the health crisis, but um, in other parts of uh, the Hungarian society? Uh, funnily enough, it's done very little uh, that would relate to the health crisis. They, they did, I would uh, guess, I mean, I, I haven't put these points uh, next to each other, but they passed uh, maybe more laws that had nothing to do with health uh, care at all. So uh, one of them is um, that now as a transgender person, you're not allowed to change uh, your um, gender or your sex uh, 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 compared to what you were born as. This, is, this has disastrous effects, which uh, I'm sure those who pass the law don't even get. They don't, they are, they don't realize where this leads. Um, they also, um, uh, for instance, they uh, took back what's called, it's not really public, um, uh, public uh, servants, but uh, but um, well, in a way, it's it's a little bit a different different um, name that we don't really have in English. But but culture, many cultural workers are considered or were considered so-called public servants, which is a which has um, a career path whereby you usually make less than uh, than another person who gets a. Uh, you know, market um, a salary that's uh, that's uh, usually on the market or that's fair uh, uh, with that regard. Um, a competitive salary is the right expression. I'm sorry. Uh, and with these public servants, you usually get less, but you there is a table whereby your salary goes up every three years. You are guaranteed. You have certain very important guarantees, like you can't be fired after a certain amount of time, and you're guaranteed a pension, which these days is we we all know is huge. And there are many other things. And the promise was always, look, you're not getting as much money, but this is a safe career. So now this safe career is cut into half with taking back this public servant um, status from everyone basically where this is librarians this is uh, theater makers this is all kinds of uh, different cultural workers so there is that uh, they are uh, Orban has been um, Budapest the capital of Hungary which uh, has one-fifth of its uh, inhabitants nearly two million it's a very uh, very much uh, centralized country in that way so there is only one real metropolis Budapest um, the opposition won um, in, um, in the fall. And um, Orban can't bear that. So now he's taking, uh, he, he already rearranged um, the uh, revenues of the city. So wh what I mean is um, taxes that are collected in Budapest. And uh, I read this in an article, I don't have double confirmation, but it sounds about right that 97% uh, of those uh, tax revenues now go to the state instead of to the city. Some of, the, some of it they do give back to the city. So I'm not saying all of that is taken away from the city, but it's centralized. So they decide about it. And now he is trying to sum up the rest of the 3%. Just to give you two very brief examples, um, parking was made free. Um, and they said because of the coronavirus, uh, there was obviously much less traffic and all that. So parking in all the city is now free. Uh, but that should have been, we can argue that we, that's, I suppose both, you can say that's good, you can say that's bad. But, uh, but as soon as the crisis uh, passed, I mean, this actual crisis, like when, when Budapest started opening up, which is like uh, a month ago now, uh, this should have been stopped because that's one of the most important revenues of the city, as are terraces of restaurants and cafes. And we all know that they suffered a lot uh, so it would be, I suppose, fair to say that you don't have to pay rent for your terraces, let's say, till mid-July. 
but they are they don't have to pay rent for their terraces now until the first of September, which is basically almost the all of the terrace season. And that mm-hmm. also goes to Budapest. So I mean they robbed Budapest of and there is many other things, but um, I've talked. Uh, I've uh, talked too much. Sorry. Yeah, you also mentioned uh, a few others uh, in your uh, article, but these are uh, uh, the way you describe them. They are clear uh, attempts to uh, uh, use the health crisis in order to uh, uh, pursue a certain political agenda. And Orban, uh, in uh, European press, has been. Um, focused for that. The emergency law was much discussed, uh, at least at, on op-ed pages in European newspapers. Less discussed was what happened in Serbia. Serbia went a little bit under the radar uh, uh, in this health crisis, but the measures taken in Serbia were at least as harsh as those in Belgrade, uh, in um, Hungary. Uh, am I right, uh, Dubravka? Uh, yeah, sure. We we had one of the most radical measures, but in the first phase, our president Vucic, he was laughing at the virus, so so he acted like uh, Donald Trump or, or similar leaders, uh, and he had his own doctors in the uh, in the <clears throat> in that team saying that this is the funniest virus that they ever saw, that this is the virus that exists only on Facebook, that. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for Serbian women to go to Milano and to buy uh, shoes, etc., etc. So though that, that was for the first few weeks. And then when they realized that the situation is very serious, then they have introduced most radical measures. So we had uh, the declared state of emergency, but it was president himself that had declared that state, not not the parliament. The, the parliament was dissolved and we didn't see the parliament for three months. And then we didn't have the lockdown as uh, the other European countries. We had a curfew for 12 hours per, every day and every weekend. So six weekends, <clears throat> we had a complete curfew for two or three days. And for Eastern, we had four days of complete cur- curfew, so we just couldn't get out. And it's not only, uh, this is not the only problem. The, the worst problem was that those curfews made huge lines and huge mess in all the shops because shops closed at three o'clock in, in the afternoon, so people didn't have time to buy enough. So, so it was a complete mess in shops. So the uh, I just want to say that the it was the government, in fact, it was the president himself who constructed, who, who made this um, <clears throat> euphoria, the fear. So, so it was a completely, uh, uh, how can I say, hysterical situation, but the hy- hysteria was a product of the governmental measures and the way the government was talking. And of course, it was very political because the, if you produce such kind of fear in society, then of course the society is asking for, for, for the firm hand and is asking almost for the dictator, so help us. Uh, so that, that was the political situation. Uh, and I'm very sorry that European countries didn't pay attention to Serbia because this was the chance, especially for China, to get in. And China came with a huge help to Serbia and it was, um, uh, uh, it, it got huge publicity all over Belgrade. There, there were huge um, PowerPoint saying thank you China, Chinese brothers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So finally, uh, the European representatives in Belgrade were forced to ask Vucic to say that it was European Union, in fact, that gave to Serbia ten times more than China. But that there was a huge pro-China propaganda, and uh, uh, I think that now, and it's also very interesting. It was not pro-Russians somewhere. Russians were lost as our best friends because they also have a lot of problems with Corona and it was the China moment that we had uh, during the Corona. So it was the internal and also foreign policy that were completely changed. But what is, as a, to stick with the China, I want to continue the, the uh, 
policy of the authorities uh, argument of yours a little bit later, but let's stick with China for a while. Uh, I've seen some of those of those banners uh, set up by one of the of the government faithful newspapers. Thank you, brother uh, China, and and like that. So it has to be uh, it has to be uh, uh, part of a conscious strategy. Uh, a political strategy. What is that strategy? Is that strategy really to just strengthen the ties with China or does it have something to do with the EU as well? Serbia is right now uh, a potential member uh, candidate. Well, it's actually a, a membership candidate uh, for the European Union. What is the, what is behind this, this, uh, this strategy? Behind the strategy is the Kosovo issue, because uh, uh, this is the main problem for Serbian uh, EU membership. So we have to settle the Kosovo issue together with uh, uh, with the Kosovo government. But it's uh, it doesn't the, the, the dialogue, the so-called dialogue didn't move for the last 20 years. So we all know that they that the Serbian government have no intention to, to do anything uh, to, to, with Kosovo to reconcile, to acknowledge, or to make uh, uh, any kind of normal relations. So this is why, in fact, Serbia is uh, uh, asking for help from Russia and China, because the Kosovo, uh, the Kosovo issue, I- issue is also in the <clears throat> in UN. Uh, so uh, the voice of China and Russia is, of course, very powerful in the uh, in UN. So they're blocking any kind of uh, uh, of uh, reconciliation between Serbia and Kosovo. And on the other hand, European Union is trying to solve this issue. So it's uh, it's somehow forcing Serbia to acknowledge. Uh, the 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 state of Kosovo, which is not going to happen. So this is this is the foreign policy, of course, issue. And then, of course, China is here uh, to give credits to to invest uh, even in very dirty industries, uh, which is not which is impossible for the European Union to do. So so China is acting like uh, <clears throat> like Serbia is its way. Um, into the European Union, so so it's a, it's a very complicated game, but it's it's tra- stronger now after Corona. Yeah, uh, I will come back to the to you in a, just a second, uh, Dobravka, and, and go from the authorities to the citizens. But uh, the China issue is actually a, a, an issue in Hungary as well, uh, Anna. Uh, Orban or Hungary got a loan to build the railroad uh, from uh, Budapest to Belgrade from China. Uh, is there a strategy, of, for example, uh, there, are, there are other I- issues as well, but is there a, a strategy uh, on the part of, of uh, the Orban government uh, and uh, in, in this respect as well, as you could see that it is in Serbia? You mean um, as a, a strategy for friendship? Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, as a, one can see it either as a strategy for friendship, or my my one hypothesis would be uh, to show uh, uh, the friends within quotes in Brussels that you could have other friends as well, and therefore uh, strengthening your your uh, bargaining situ- uh, position. Or is this too spe- speculative? You think? Well, I, I don't think I know enough uh, for that to answer that, but uh, in a way, yes. I mean, certainly there is, let's, let's uh, not just specifically about the railroad, because the railroad, like the new uh, Paksh uh, uh, center, is, is about mostly about uh, corruption. So it's mostly about giving the tenders to friendly companies and friendly undertakers, and then pocketing you know, a lot of that money. So I think that's maybe the most important goal of these huge, very extremely expensive and very questionable uh, ventures. Uh, but uh, as a, let's say as a general rule, uh, there is certainly a very strong rhetoric that we are turning toward the East rather than the West and that we have allies over there from Azerbaijan to uh, of course China as well. But uh, 
at least, but I'm not an expert at this uh, uh, to any extent, but um, um, I wouldn't say that China is necessarily the big hero, uh, uh, which would be risky as well with the coronavirus. So I, we have seen with Trump that, uh, you know, his rhetoric toward China has changed. Uh, he was calling it the Chinese virus initially. We, we've all seen the pictures of his speech where he crossed out corona and uh, substituted it with Chinese virus. Um, but at any rate, there is certainly this turning toward the East. Um, but, uh, but also we sense sometime, sometimes one has the, the problem is that the EU is um, not being uh, strict enough at all uh, with Hungary. They should be much more uh, proactively strict and shouldn't just, you know, admonish Hungary or, you know, publish uh, a statement whereby they uh, scold the Hungarian government, but they should, uh, I think one of the biggest issues is that they are not controlling the EU funds uh, nearly close enough. So actually there are, there are, there's one article after the other comes out about, uh, I don't know, a well that was supposed to built in a village. And then uh, the journalist goes there from EU funds. And then the journalist goes there and there is nothing. There is no well. And so there are many, many times they take EU funds for major undertakings. And in some cases, in, there is nothing, absolutely nothing is built from that money. And oftentimes when something is built, uh, there are other huge major issues. So I think one of the things that the EU could do, obviously we have to solve our own problem. We can't wait for the EU to save us from Orban. I don't think that's realistic. I don't think it's their job altogether. But I think it should be their job to really control the EU funds and really look where the money is going and then withdraw the EU funds if they are not going for the purposes they were supposed to. Thank you. Uh, you stressed that as well, uh, Dobravka, that the EU actually missed the chance during this uh, uh, crisis to to say uh, and emphasize uh, the importance of certain democratic standards and, and, and so on. But I want to come back to your uh, argument about the authorities uh, using the chance uh, the health crisis presents to act out authoritarian tendencies. Uh, that, you write in your article, was to be expected. What perhaps wasn't uh, so expected was the way the citizens would agree uh, would react uh, to that and uh, could you say something more about uh, about your analysis here um, yeah this is this was more or less the analysis of uh, what happened in the streets and the shops and all around you those days and then you saw those frightening examples that uh, uh, people are in fact uh, that they, 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 they were very happy to have that power finally in their hands. Uh, and then if you if there was a queue in front of the shop, so everybody was uh, uh, was um, shouting, stay in the queue, don't try to to get around the queue, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, that was in a very authoritarian way. So you, uh, I had the impression that everybody was, not everybody, but that the majority was very happy that finally some Ordnung came in the streets and that finally everybody can take that Ordnung in its own hands and become a little dictator in the shop. So, for example, one of the most um, radical measures in Serbia was that people older than uh, 65, so 65 plus, they were not allowed to get out at all for three months. And this was really uh, totally crazy because th there are a lot of people older than 65 that are alone, that don't, don't have anybody around, so they couldn't get even to the shops, nothing. And then... It was practically every time in the shop when there was somebody obviously older than 65 that people were shouting, you, you should not be here, go back home, you are not allowed, and things like this. So, so you finally, uh, uh, you under I understood on my own skin how the fascism in fact comes from the top down to, to every citizen. So, so why is it possible? Because 
there are always those theoretical discussions how how fascism that Nazi regime was possible. But then in few days of Corona, I could have understand that because suddenly everybody felt that power of little people uh, practicing this dictatorship in the shop, on the street, in the park, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there is something in many individuals and within the society that is um, close to, 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 that, uh, to that authoritarian rule. Yeah, and then you, you add yet another um, characteristic to the way, to the way that citizens uh, react to this, namely that, that when uh, their rights are taken away, on the one hand, from the authorities where democracy is, is limited, uh, there are then certain freedoms there that are acted out uh, excessively uh, when uh, the lid is, so to say, uh, lifted. And as I, if I understand it correctly, it's this combination that you think is, is kind of toxic, and, but which is built in in the way that uh, illiberal democracy uh, works. Uh, and you take, uh, uh, from this you draw a conclusion and you put it into a formula, which you, called, you call herd democracy. Could you describe this a little bit? Yeah, well, uh, in some countries, including Sweden, they were looking for the herd immunity. So there, there was that theory that we could get, <coughs> sorry, the, the immunity of, um, mass immunity and that will be the end of uh, corona and it didn't happen but then somehow it looked to me that uh, we had something else and i called it her democracy because then on one hand everybody took ordnung it's in its own hands but on the other hand there were many individuals that acted completely irrationally without masks, without social distancing, with groupings <laughs> in the parks, in streets, in, um, in coffee shops, although it was forbidden. So, but unfortunately it was not the protest asking for more freedom, asking for more, uh, for more um, democracy. On the contrary, it was again uh, that I, can take as much of freedom as I can, the same way as I can take somebody else's freedom. So it's, it was again some kind of a, a part, uh, the different side of anarchy. So this, the, it was some way be, somewhere between anarchy and author, uh, authoritarian regime. And that was frightful because in fact, uh, the results are very bad because Serbia, we were not so bad if you look 12,426 cases, but all, but if you compare with Slovenia, with Croatia, with Bosnia, uh, those numbers that we had per million are double or even triple than Croatia. So we had the most radical measures that in fact didn't help the society and didn't help uh, the treatment of pandemia. So that, that's one of my arguments that maybe luckily we understood that dictatorships in fact didn't help, uh, which is the case of Russia, for example, or some other countries uh, which didn't succeed uh, to fight back. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask you, Anna, uh, very briefly uh, about uh, uh, your technical uh, issues. Uh, how much battery do you have left? Um, sorry, I have eleven percent, but uh, it doesn't say the time. Uh, okay, that's good. No, I will. I will ask you a, a, a question. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so you told uh, me before when we discussed this that uh, because what what uh, Dobravka is talking about is a is a it is an atmosphere in society. Uh, that uh, could go in, in, in many different ways, into anarchy and excessive uh, uh, 
yeah, making excessive use of, of, of freedoms, on the other hand, accepting uh, authoritarian rule. You told me about uh, cultural life and academic life in uh, Hungary uh, right now. Is there an answer uh, to the authoritarian tendencies that has been emphasized during this uh, health crisis in Budapest? Um, I would say that I just wrote this to someone today that um, as opposed to America where the dangers are that people uh, are, uh, you know, uh, toppling over statutes uh, which have nothing to do uh, with uh, with the uh, racism that's uh, uh, that's so present and that uh, the whole uh, demonstration is about or in France where we know that very quickly uh, any issue can lead to people um, setting fire to um, um, b b garbage bins and cars and whatever in Hungary, the issue is the opposite, that people are not nearly active enough. Uh, so that there is, um, I tend to say that, um, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if I, I, I came up with this, but probably other people came up with this before um, uh, uh, me, that uh, democracy apparently is an acquired taste. So that somehow uh, many Hungarian citizens, citizens are not aware of their uh, rights and their duties. Uh, so there is, I, I wouldn't say there is no, you know, nothing going on, but uh, as specific to the coronavirus, obviously it's difficult because we, you can't have theater shows, obviously. Um, but uh, um, if you don't mind me mentioning the University of Theater and Film where I uh, teach and where I used to study, that's also under attack now. So also uh, under the emergency law, which by the way, also rejected the Istanbul Treaty for protection of violence against women. That's very important. I forgot to mention that before. So now they are trying to um, take over the University of uh, Theater and Film, which is a 155 year old institution and the only state institution teaching at least 20 uh, different theater and film professions from editor to theater director and obviously actor as well and many others. And uh, now this is, uh, they, are, uh, they also are forcing an impossible, forcing an impossible schedule on us. So they want this change of uh, the state institution turning over to a, uh, becoming a, a foundation, which in itself could be good but uh, it would May be I ruled. just interrupt yes. you and ask who, yes. who are they? Who uh, the, are go they? the government, the, the, the government. As a ministry I mean, of, of education in this case. Well, so. funnily enough, uh, uh, since recently we don't belong, there is, well, first of all, there is no such thing as ministry of education. You know, as I wrote in my article, there is this multi-ministry responsible for, you know, half uh, of life. But also we were now, uh, like a half a year ago, uh, there, a new ministry was created, the Ministry of uh, Innovation or whatever, technical, technic, technicality or technique and in innovation or something like this. And we now belong to that ministry, which means absolutely no one at that ministry has absolutely any clue of anything with regards to culture or education. Uh, so now there is, so what now, there will be a vote in parliament about uh, this bill that they proposed. First of all, there is a culture uh, committee in parliament and they wouldn't allow uh, the dean of our school to attend the very session, which was about nothing else but the University of Theatre and uh, Film. And for half a year, they refused to appoint the dean or rector that the Senate uh, voted. Uh, for uh, so we now on pro forma we now have no rector or no dean um, and uh, they are just simply there is absolutely no answers to any of the questions basically and now they are going to vote on this on on Monday interestingly I started a, I, I, I wrote a statement with a film colleague uh, on uh, behalf of uh, alumni of this institution which uh, we now have uh, 800 signatures for. This is very recent. And you have many obviously famous people like celebrities like Oscar winning, Academy Award winning film director, very famous uh, actors and directors and all that. And suddenly uh, three days ago, I got a call from this minister's uh, secretary that they want to 
uh, discuss the law with us. So whereas they refuse to uh, receive anyone from the university for half a year, suddenly there is such a thing as a, a you know, a, a, a civic uh, endeavor, and now they want to talk to us. But I must say that I'm positive that they have no idea who I am. They think I'm just some harmless little, you know, old alumna of this institution, because if they had checked, I bet you they would never have called me, um, which this is a whole uh, new, very complex situation. But basically, they will be voting on the bill next Monday or Tuesday, and we don't expect any uh, discussion. But there is, thank God, there is a lot of effort on the on the part of the present students to do things. But the problem is, we just had huge discussions about this last night, uh, that they are building, uh, being told by the management of the university uh, uh, we, who have the best intentions. Everyone has the best intentions and everyone is only talking about this for half a year. So they spend, you know, they never sleep and everyone is trying their best to save this institution, which is a very, a uh, high quality worldwide known institution, I suppose, uh, that they are now telling the students not to do any actions on their own until that forum last night. And they are, you know, there is, um, and the students are not conscious enough to say, look, we don't need your permission. Absolutely. And they actually on the, you know, just the opposite, they go to uh, the management of the university in fear of, you know, screwing up their efforts. So in, in fear of going against their strategy, which is a valid fear, but I really, I think they should just go ahead and really now we should organize, we're talking about organizing a demonstration now and some very strong, we have very, very little time left. So, but, but there is something going on at least. Yeah, something going on at least, which is not very hopeful. Uh, actually, you said before that, uh, it's not the task of the EU to uh, change the inner politics of, of Hungary and change the, the, the way the, the balance in Parliament is. It's up to the Hungarians. And where I have a couple of questions also, also coming from some of, of those viewing this. Where is actually the opposition in Hungary? And is there any prospect of uh, that opposition getting its act together so much that there will be a possible change uh, in the future. Uh, and is the rest of uh, the Hungarians just as uh, um, aware of the fact that the EU can't actually change these inner, th despite the fact that there is an Article 7 uh, case against Hungary right now. But uh, so where is the opposition? What is the, what are the prospects? Well, uh... Uh, just to, to be aware of this, the opposition, like I said, won in Budapest. And, and the way to do that was that for the first time in a very long time, they actually joined efforts. So they, we had a pre-selection completely organized by them. This is in no law book or anything. This was just a private um, 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 uh, thing on their part. And uh, they all, all of the candidates vowed that vowed that they would let the winner run alone. And this is what happened. So that's how Gergely Karacsony could become um, mayor of Budapest. So that's very important. Uh, also- that, before, Is that the strategy that could be used nationally as well? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, one of the main opposition parties, uh, which is called uh, Politics Can Be Different, uh, and as well as the Young Party momentum are very culpable for the two-third majority of the Fidesz government because they refused. We used to have two. We have we used to have two round uh, um, elections, and uh, oh sorry, I need to close this alert. Yes, so uh, we used to have uh, elections in, with two rounds, whereby obviously by the second round you could. Uh, uh, the third place, the, the one who got on the in third place could just uh, uh, give his uh, um, place or her place over to one of the other candidates and endorse one of them. Uh, and Fidesz uh, did away with that. So now there is only one round, uh, which is very much uh, uh, is very helpful to them. And these opposition, major opposition party uh, uh, parties and mem their members refused to step down, even though they were they had absolutely no hopes of winning a certain district. 
and uh, we had in most cases every hope that they, if they give if they endorse the opposition candidate from a different party then that opposition candidate would win so they are very much at fault for this two-third situation. Fidesz would have won with all the gerrymandering and all the rewriting of the laws and also the votes, this is key, of the uh, Hungarians living in the diaspora because that's one of their, you know, that's also one of their major topics. So there is but an... Do you, uh, yeah. do you have any hope of, of that it will happen, that it will work? This joining of the efforts? Yes. Look, I'm, I'm such an optimist that I do, but uh, I suppose most people would tell you, well, very little, but I think we can, I mean, I think we should, and I think uh, we could do it. I do hope that, that they, you know, that, that, that they realize this. I mean, it's obvious this is, re you know, this has been uh, uh, written down by every expert, you know, many, many years ago. So it's, it's an obvious, uh, um, it's not a guarantee that we, we would uh, get Orban and his cronies out of power, absolutely not, but uh, I think it is the only hope. And then, of course, there is this other issue linked to that, uh, that among the opposition uh, parties, there is one that's an extreme right party or used to be. Now they pretend that they have turned around. Um, many, many people, very clever people believe them. I don't. I think when they uh, get into power, that's when we would see their real, uh, you know, how they really are. So there is this huge debate of whether or not we should accept this extreme right or formerly extreme right wing uh, party into such a coalition of uh, opposition parties or not. And now I'm going to have to switch over to my phone. So I'll just turn off the camera, but I'm listening to you, okay? Yeah, that's a good time. Dubravka, uh, the question of the opposition uh, in Serbia. Uh, is there a live, an alive opposition uh, in Serbia? And I want to throw in a second question there as well. You said before that the EU missed a chance uh, uh, during this crisis to emphasize the uh, importance of rule of law, of uh, uh, certain demo democratic standards. And there are accession talks uh, going on. Uh, is, does, do these talks have no impact, uh, not on the opposition now, but on the ruling party? Well, let's start with European Union, <clears throat> because again, as I said before, European Union has only uh, the Kosovo issue on its agenda, and somehow they believe, uh, Alexander Vucic, that he will solve that issue, which he, he has no intention to do. So he's in power for eight years already, European Union, for some reason, I don't know why, believes him, and they're supporting him. In believe that he finally will recognize Kosovo as the state or do whatever it's supposed to do. So this is one part of the problem. So opposition does not have the support of European Union. On the other hand, the opposition is maybe even worse than the government itself. So we did have protests and demonstrations for more than a year organized by students in 60 towns in Serbia. And it was really impressive. At the Faculty of Philosophy where I work, we had debates every week and we had hundreds of people coming there. So it was really a movement. And the opposition finally joined and made the coalition, but decided to boycott the elections. And then they split. So now we have two parties that will uh, that, 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 that will take part in the elections and the others that are boycotting. So the final result will be 80% for Alexander Vucic and they just gave them, they, they just gave him the whole power. So it's, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Which is a situation which is very similar to that that has been in Hungary for the last 10 years or so. And But what uh, if the, the inner... Uh, the inner political landscape is so uh, fragmented and, and the, the opposition is so uh, so not unified. Uh, what, what is it that can be done from the outside? Uh, uh, you, you stressed, okay, it's the Kosovo issue, it's the Kosovo issue, it's the Kosovo issue. That is the, an international thing, uh, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, 
but what what is there anything that one can do from the outside as as for example the european union well it's obvious it's obvious that european union or whoever uh, is uh, I don't know how to say, but does not want to say to Vucic that he is ruling as an authoritarian or even dictatorial uh, regime. So, so they are just letting him do anything he wants. We have today maybe two media that are free, one daily, two or three weekly, and just one uh, TV channel. So, so he's just killing media and he's... Uh, He's really, uh, he, the, it's really dangerous for many, many journalists were threatened. Uh, some of them were, uh, their, their houses were burned down. So, so it's, it, it really becomes dangerous. And it seems that European Union is just uh, uh, letting him do everything. On the other hand, I think that uh, I'm not sure that the joint coalition of opposition parties is the, uh, is the best thing, because uh, the same thing as in Hungary, we have an extreme right political party, which is the part of, uh, of that coalition. So they are extremely pro-Russian, they're totally Euro anti-skeptic. So how, how can they, they be in the same coalition? So I think that the wise politics from Brussels, for example, would be to enforce a pro-European democratic coalition and to leave all those guys who are anti-European to make their, their own coalition. So that, then finally we will see where is where are we really going? I mean, what, what, what's our real political aim? Because if again, they're all together, and this is what happened to us after Milosevic, so we had a huge coalition in which all possible parties were there, pro-European, anti-European, and we ended in the dead in the dead end. So this is the end of that kind of coalition. So I think that this time we should try something else. And this time means after 21st of June, June you mean? Because uh... yes, unfortunately, unfortunately, because they're boycotting this uh, this election, so uh, so we will have to wait for for another chance. Yeah, but in your article, you actually uh, uh, also flag for a, a, an even grander new start. You you say that uh, uh, we didn't get the, the herd immunity. What we got was herd democracy, and it seems as if we need to start all over again. And what you mean with that, uh, I suppose, is uh, it's a grand question now, but it's, it's a, a different type of, of democratic system or a dis different type of democracy. This is a, at least my assumption. Am I right in assuming that? And what is that? Uh, I don't, we're at the end of our, our hour here now, and this we could probably talk about for a year, but uh, in, in short, in short terms. Yeah, well, for example, we saw even in US that uh, freedoms and democracy are very weak. So we can see now what Trump is doing with courts, with, uh, with media, et cetera, et cetera. So, so he's acting more or less like our home dictatorships uh, and dictators and authoritarians. So we, we, we saw finally that the fight for freedom and democracy is not over, that we have to find constantly. And what I was thinking of was a different kind of state. Because finally, I think that, and I hope that coronavirus will show that the neoliberal state is over, that we need, again, some kind of, um, of welfare state, because it, it's clear after this crisis, societies in crisis like this, and we will have some more crises because of uh, <clears throat> environmental issues or another pandemia, uh, societies are too weak to answer this kind of global crisis that we are facing. So I think that something very deep in, in, the, uh, uh, in the concept of the state should be, should be changed and must be changed. And it's already changed. Uh, we're really coming to an end and I would like to ask you two provocative questions uh, to end with. And I would ask you to keep uh, the answers fairly short. Uh, and the first question goes to uh, Anna. Uh, no, I will do it the other way around. The first question goes to Dubravka. Uh, can you see uh, in the 
at least midterm future Serbia uh, being a member of the European Union? No. <laughs> That's very short, isn't it? Very uh, short. No, again, because of Kosovo issue. Uh, they, they will not solve the, the Kosovo issue, and this is the major, uh, the major issue uh, in front of us in order to become the uh, EU member. So, so I, I don't think it's solvable for the moment, uh, and, or at least for those generations. Uh, I will pose the same question to you, uh, Anna, but uh, a little bit twisted. Uh, can you imagine uh, that in the midterm future, Hungary is not a member of the European Union? I can't really know because uh, for two things, because Article 7 is, as we have seen, is very complicated. It's almost impossible to actually kick someone out. So despite all the warnings and all, all of that. Um, and the other reason is that, uh, I also touched upon earlier, um, is that the monies are coming from the EU. So I doubt, despite all of his rhetoric, I doubt that Orban would want to uh, get us out of the EU because then he would have no money. And please, I, 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 I apologize for the quality of the picture. I don't know what was going on with my laptop. It was fully charged and yet it went on. Don't worry, it, work, it works very well. Uh, we're anyway out of time now. And uh, I want to thank you for a very interesting talk. We will uh, have one of these talks again next week. Then uh, Marius Ivatskevicius, a uh, Lithuanian playwright, will talk to Sergei Lebedev, Russian uh, novelist. And their texts will be published uh, later this week on the website of Debates on Europe and on Vox Europe. Uh, and in Vox Europe, it, they are published in four languages, in English, German, French, and Italian. Thank you so much for uh, this discussion and see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you.